Hello everyone, this is Rajiv here. Welcome to Securium's SafeCast series on Safu with Securium, where our special guest today is Dan Vido from TrailerBits. TrailerBits is one of the sponsor partners of Securium's Epoch Zero Bootcamp on smart contract security auditing. Dan Vido is the co-founder and CEO of TrailerBits, a software security R&D firm with specialized practices in low-level security, cryptography, and blockchain security, with tools such as Slither, Echidna, and Manticore that have been released to help the community. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for coming on Securium Safecast series on Safu with Securium. So, Dan, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, Trail of Things. Uh, yeah, sure. So I think you got the basics right. We're a software security research and development firm. We're about 10 years old. I founded it with two friends of mine, and we've grown it up to about 80 people now. Um, we do work across the technology industry. So we do work in tech, defense, and finance. Uh, we do work on low-level security, on cryptography, on blockchain security, on cloud-native software. Um, you know, we are not a blockchain firm. We are a security firm that knows how to do blockchain software. Uh, I got started doing this kind of thing really early. You know, I've been uh, messing around with <laughs> security vulnerabilities and hacking into stuff since I was like 14, 15. Um, I credit it to a lot of really frustrating experiences in school and teachers I wanted to play pranks on. But uh, I went to school to study computer security. I went to what was called then Polytechnic University. Now it's NYU Tandon. And uh, they have a formalized security program. I was going through the very first iteration of that. So I like to say that people that are younger than me probably had security courses available. And people that are older than me probably learned from their peers they learned from like a master apprentice relationship. And I kind of straddled the gap where I had a little bit of both. Um, but, you know, I've always wanted to do things. I want to go where the action is, right? Like I worked at, uh, I don't tell, <laughs> I'm a little bit more open about these things nowadays, but I used to work at the National Security Agency for a little bit. Um, I did uh, work for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, I worked at some tech startups. Uh, I worked at ISIC Partners, uh, which turned into NCC Group, so that I could see kind of Silicon Valley. And now at Trail of Bits, we try to work with people that have highly consequential security problems to solve. You know, like again, I want to go where the action is. I want to go where people actually have consequences when security things happen. Um, and those are the kinds of people that I want to help. Those are the kinds of problems that I want to solve. So Trail of Bits is a vehicle that lets me do that. And it's motivating for a lot of other people, I think, too. So, Dan, we have this fun format for uh, SafeCast, where we have only eight questions, loaded questions, though, that we'll be discussing. And in the spirit of programming language nerdiness, the questions are zero index from zero to seven. So let's start with question zero. Question zero is about trailer bits and its involvement specifically in Ethereum security. What were the origins of Trailer Bits getting into the Ethereum security space? What kind of uh, projects is Trailer Bits currently involved with? What does uh, the team look like? Are there any special focus areas? And how has all this evolved in the last few years? Yeah, so I'm not going to lie. The initial interest for starting to work with blockchain security was the, the, uh, the data hack, it, <laughs> which I think it was for a lot of people. And it was a realization that, oh my God, there are ways that people can make money from this, that this is a really great opportunity as an attacker to steal things and that there is money to be stolen. And this goes back to what I said in the answer to the earlier question, um, which is that Trail of Bits tries to work on high consequence security problems. We want to work for people that have actual downsides to getting hacked because there's a lot of people out there for which getting hacked means getting a you know, credit card monitoring or whatever. It's it's something that like, oh no, you know, we have to apologize to all of our customers, but at the end of the day, life goes on. And, you know, for the areas that we work in, um, we really want to find people where that is not the case. And blockchain fits that mold. Um, in blockchain, you know, a lot of the, the consequences of getting hacked are, are, are not reversible or they're extremely difficult to reverse. Um, and since the consequences are so high, people are very willing to, uh, pay for security help to adopt new research techniques when they uh, build software and and generally to consider security as a first class citizen when they're thinking through development. 
So those are all kinds of like the magic bits and pieces that I think make it a really interesting client base to serve. And that's why we did it. So, you know, before that, Trail of Bits was working on low-level security and compilers. We were doing a lot of work for programming languages and uh, programming language theory, that sort of thing, particularly for DARPA. We were building, you know, ROP compilers and static analysis systems, and we were modifying LLVM and building fuzzers. And all that stuff is great, but it's also like for, for, for C++ or for other like languages that are well known, it is the opposite of a green field. It is well studied. Everybody knows what all the challenges are. Um, but we had the skills to solve those sorts of problems. So when blockchain showed up, it was an enormous green field. There were no solutions to any problems. It was a brand new runtime, a brand new programming language. It was a brand new environment for us to work in and nobody had solved any problems yet. And that was really attractive to us because we were able to set the standard from the onset very high. And that's what we did. So rather than you know offer consulting services or whatever, or like build a product or something like that, our very first thing in the uh, blockchain space was we built a symbolic executor for the EVM uh, bytecode format. So Manticore was the very first thing that we did. And Manticore is our symbolic executor. It works for x86. Uh, or rather, at the time, it worked for x86. Now it works for a few other platforms as well. But, uh, you know, we just took two or well, probably about two people, and we had them work on that for a few weeks or months and released it. And in fact, I got a Twitter notification today as we're recording this on the 19th that uh, it's been exactly four years since we released that first version with EVM support. Um, and then once we released the version of the EVM support, then we started saying like, hey, are, is anybody interested in this kind of thing? And some people popped out of the woodwork and found us locally in New York and said, hey, we'll offer you money if you help us secure this. And um, once that happened, uh, we started building a small team around it. And, and now it's grown. So now it's uh, you know about, um, I'd say, 15 people within Trail of Bits are working on blockchain security in some way. And we're not just focused on Ethereum. We do work for a couple other chains as well. There's there's some kind of chains that I really like that I, I think have really interesting technical features that have some good adoption that uh, generally offer really compelling reasons for us to spend that limited time we have. Um, so we've done some work on Algorand. We've done some work on Solana. We've done some work on uh, we've done some work on Tezos, uh, Hyperledger. Um, you know uh, what what else is here? Oh, and Polkadot. Um, and, and Cosmos and Tenderman. Um, so those tend to be, you know, areas that we work. And it's, it's extended from not just smart contracts, but it's also gone down to like layer one blockchains. We've done lots of work, work on blockchain nodes and clients. And then because of our connection to the finance industry, we've also helped a lot of people do asset custody. Um, so how do they securely store the cryptocurrency that they own? And um, how do they kind of broker access to it between their clients because they're probably holding it for somebody else. And how do they make sure they give it to the right person when somebody tries to issue a withdrawal or a deposit, or something like that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, not trying to solve every problem in the space, but there's definitely a lot of things that we have our hands in. Question one is about web two versus web three security. Blockchain is only one focus area of trade pets, as you mentioned. You offer services in software assurance, security engineering, and also perform different aspects of R&D. So in that broader context, when you look at the security of projects in the blockchain and crypto space, Web3, what specific technical concerns or challenges do you see? For example, the fast-moving technological components, such as the blockchain protocol itself, the compiler, the tooling, the maturity and complexity of projects that come for audits in the space compared to what you see in the Web2 space, expectations of your clients, the quality of audits from the many other auditing firms, audits being used as a rubber stamp by a few projects for marketing, etc. So what can Web3 projects learn from decades of Web2 security R&D both in academia and industry. And also, how does this differ in terms of the notions of practical and effective security versus uh, what is known as uh, security theater 
or uh, perceptions in your opinion? Yeah, sure. So I'll actually flip this around because I think it's pretty interesting to consider what Web 2 can learn from Web 3. Um, and I did a whole presentation on this. I wrote a keynote at um, High Confidence uh, Software and Systems, HCSS, which is a really kind of, I wouldn't say stuffy, but it's a, it's a pretty formal academic conference of leaders in kind of programming language theory and software verification uh, that um, had me keynote about two or three years ago, and I talked about what the blockchain got right, because it's pretty unique. Like when we talk to um, most of our normal clients, uh, they don't come to me with, you know, symbolic unit tests or security properties that are defined or any kind of verification. Um, I'm lucky if I get fuzz test cases out of them. I'm lucky if I get good unit test coverage out of them. Um, so really, there, there's something here to be said about the testability, I think, of a lot of blockchain software versus a lot of like, uh, you know, normal, typical, traditional software. Um, a lot of traditional software like modifies global state quite a lot. Like there's all kinds of different ways that during the execution of a program, you can work into some kind of corner that you can't easily test from a cold start. Um, there's a lot of like dynamic libraries that get loaded. Like when you, you know, you're, we're, we're both recording this inside Chrome and uh, on your computer, there might be all these different libraries that get loaded um, that like, you know, th th there could be different uh, like network data that gets sent to your computer that changes what code gets executed inside of Chrome. I could be on a different version of Mac OS um, or we could be on Windows or we could be on Linux or we could be on any other operating system. Uh, and it's not all the same Chrome, like it's a different version because it's got all this different environmental stuff that changes. Whereas on the blockchain, there's really only one blockchain. Everybody runs the exact same thing. And I know that when I run my blockchain software, it's running the same as it does on your computer. Uh, and that's a really powerful concept when it comes to software testing. And I think it's something that's that reproducibility is really lacking uh, when it comes to regular software. The constraints are also obviously like a, a huge kind of pro and a con. Um, the fact that you can really only run programs that are like 10,000 instructions long um, enables you to do testing in a way that you just can't if you're trying to test Chrome. Chrome is, you know, millions of lines of code. And if I wanted to symbolically execute uh, Chrome, then I would really have to focus on very specific parts of it. I would have to do like very, very tiny features one at a time, and I would probably need like a Google-sized cluster to do so. But on the blockchain, I can symbolically execute every single path in the entire smart contract uh, without too much effort. I can do it on my MacBook. Uh, which is kind of a phenomenally different environment to be in. And even beyond that, um, the, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, eat, eat. Ah, shoot, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, um, so testability of, of blockchain software is, is real. Oh, oh, the instructions. Uh, obviously, like, uh, so EVM versus... Uh, x86. Uh, you know, Manticore was extremely difficult. It was a years, multi-year-long program with, um, you know, many different people trying to write a symbolic executor for x86, whereas writing a symbolic executor for EVM, it's not trivial. Like, you know, you probably don't want to do it in a weekend. It wouldn't be that great. But you could do it in like an order of, of days and or, you know, single digit weeks. Um, it is It is really not uh, a huge challenge because the instruction uh, language is, is, is quite simple. Um, so all this really enables a lot of experimentation and testing, and it enables a lot of uh, testable code that comes out the other end. Whereas when we look at other clients that bring us code, a lot of their software is untestable. It you know depends on uh, a certain state to be set up. It depends on certain libraries. It depends on um, just like a variety of, of factors that uh, you know, it depends on a certain build system. It uses a different compiler. It, uh, you know, uses certain language features, whatever. A lot of times we'll get like some random virtual machine from a client to run things inside. That's been very finely tweaked by their DevOps team because that's the only place the software actually runs, which is nuts. You can't build a testing system that way. Uh, so there's a lot of benefits to what, what blockchain has done. On the other hand, I think you alluded to uh, the places where kind of blockchain has gone a little bit off course, which is uh, really in the in the, like soft skills around consuming security. So even though we have this incredible opportunity to apply research techniques to software and make software that's fundamentally more secure than regular software, 
we've got these really inexperienced consumers of that. Um, when I'm dealing with blockchain clients, I'm always educating them about what security is, what security properties are, what these verification techniques are, and then also just how to plan a security program. Um, a lot of people might understand testing, but they don't understand everything else that comes with a security program, like how you manage risk um, and how you think about security audits and what the outcomes are going to be and how that can fit into a larger system that you're developing. Uh, when I deal with clients on, on sales calls, a lot of them is just educating them about, hey, here is the process that we will go through to test your software. Here are the outcomes Here's what a report looks like. And it's just the same conversation over and over and over again. It's, it's challenging. Um, so this like expertise that's widely available in the like, you know, regular technology world hasn't really made it over to blockchain. A lot of the people that are doing blockchain stuff, um, they are younger. They are less experienced. A lot of them are you know, in their early 20s, they're just graduating from college if they even went. And they're really like eschewing that, that, that kind of experience. And it's to their own uh, uh, demise. It's, it's, it's not to their benefit to do so. Um, there's also, you know, from an inexperienced consumption perspective, uh, you, you mentioned that there's plenty of firms out there that are offering security help that really don't have the business of doing so. Uh, just to be totally honest, like there was always this concern that there were a lot of people that took ICO money back in like 2019 or 2018 or whatever it was, and they weren't actually going to build a product or they built these like facades. Um, and luckily, you know, that's changed. Those people are mostly gone. But the blockchain security part of the industry was just as filled with those kinds of fakers as the regular blockchain part. There's a lot of people that like don't understand the, the level of consequences that we're dealing with. They raise their hand and they say, oh yes, I can do security stuff. But the level of security that they can offer is not the level of security that blockchain stuff needs. Um, so a lot of times I also have to educate people about how to read our reports and how to read to find what good results look like and how to measure the outputs of, of what you get when you do audits. So uh, you know, th that's an area for improvement, I think, in the, in the management of these sorts of, of projects, not so much the technology. Question two is related to the previous question, but focusing more on the non-technical or business concerns and challenges. The growing demand for audits, your clients or uh, hires being geo-distributed much more than earlier them wanting to be anonymous or pseudo-anonymous, wanting to pay or be paid in cryptocurrencies, and uncertain regulations around crypto itself. How does all this affect you, Trailer Bits, as a company, given that you're headquartered out of the US? Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, right now we take payment in cryptocurrency, but we do it through BitPay. Uh, and there's probably other services like BitPay, but the general the general like format here is that BitPay receives the cryptocurrency from the client that wants to pay with it, and then we receive U.S. dollars at the other end. And it really it keeps our like quote unquote hands clean, where we don't actually have to handle any cryptocurrency. Um, it keeps my taxes very simple. It makes my accountant happy. It makes my bank happy. It makes um, a lot of people happy in that I only deal with fiat currency, uh, which kind of keeps everything simple from an operational perspective. It also keeps my integrity, uh, you know, as an audit firm. I don't want to pick winners, right? Like I might like certain kinds of technology. Like I think it's really interesting that Solana has built all this stuff on Rust and eBPF. That's cool. I can say that as a technologist, but if I held, you know, $10 million worth of Solana in our corporate treasury and how much money Trail of Bits made was dependent on the price of Solana, then people might perceive that I have different outcomes in mind when I do audits for different firms. So I don't really want to be in the business of holding tokens for an individual uh, project or for an ecosystem. Uh, you know, the financial outcome should be differentiated from uh, whether I think it's cool technology. Um, so, you know, we try to keep our, uh, keep our integrity um, for, for trail of bits. Now there are a lot of firms that want to remain anonymous uh, for some of them we've dealt with, but for most of them, we won't. Um, these anonymous firms 
prevent us like when we sign contracts with people to do audits they have certain requirements that the other end has to has to provide right like they have to agree to pay us they have to um you know uh if they violate confidentiality we need to be able to go bop them over the head if they violate certain terms of the contract i need to be able to go track them down and say and, and you know hold their feet to the fire and say this is what you agreed to you need to hold up your end of the deal um so our master services agreement has about 30 or 40 different clauses in it which are expectations from my end of like hey i'm going to provide you services they're going to be delivered on this day here's what they're going to look like and so on and so forth and from their end they also have requirements and if they're anonymous and I can't track them down, I also can't enforce those. Um, so uh, we we really like consider any kind of anonymous transaction like that to be extraordinarily high risk, and we're only going to work with them if it's a well known project, if uh, if the project somehow has like contained the risk for us, if things go awry, that the fact that we can't track down who we did it for is is not going to be a problem because um, there is. You know, a, a concern that a lot of people are using these audit reports as marketing documents. And that's another aspect of our integrity that we try to keep. When we write our reports, I'm not praising anybody. I'm not like giving this really flowering language about how amazing it was to work with people and how the code is excellent. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be emotional when I communicate these reports because we know that whether the person is anonymous or not, they might go out there and they might publish the report and try to use it as if it said those things. So another way that we limit our risk is we try to be very not emotional when we write reports. We try to be very much just about the technology. We avoid the use of adjectives, right? Like we try to be very specific about exactly what it is that we're describing. Um, because now if somebody is uh, well known to us and I have their phone number, and I can call them and they, they publish something that says like, well, you should use our product because Trail a bit said it was secure. <laughs> I can call them up and say, hey, you're violating the terms of our agreement. This isn't, uh, you know, you told me that you wouldn't be using the report this way. Uh, here's a better way to describe it. And we work with a lot of our clients to help them frame the work they do. Because that's, again, it goes back to this kind of inexperienced management of a lot of blockchain companies. They don't know how to talk about the security program they're building. So we can help them do that. But every once in a while, I need to pull out a stick and, you know, knock people over the head a little bit. And if there's some random anonymous person that just disappears into the ether and I have to go track them down and tell them to do that, you know, I don't have a lot of recourse, right? Like there's no way that I can, that I can do that. So, you know, on one hand, that's the reason why the contractual things would be set up the way they are. But on the other hand, uh, there's, there's still a limit to like what I can do after the fact. So before I write the report, I really need to consider what we write, what we say, how we say it and whether somebody else could misconstrue it. So we actually have a team of technical editors inside Trail of Bits that review all of our documents for language like this and remove any of those emotional statements uh, and make sure that we're being very specific about when we refer to flaws or we refer to the current state of uh, the system that we assessed. Because we know that uh, people will eventually take these things and misconstrue them somehow, and we want to try to provide as many opportunities possible to not misconstrue them. But, um, but yeah, I guess to boil this down, uh, you know, not only are we in the United States, we're also in New York, which means bit license and, uh, you know, the New York, uh, department of financial services, uh, New York DFS. Um, so there is kind of, there are like a lot of eyes, um, on a specific region of the world, um, in terms of regulation and, and then our bank too, our bank is very sophisticated when it comes to cryptocurrency. Uh, they're one of the bankers that work with a couple of cryptocurrency exchanges, but as a consequence to that, they have a special cryptocurrency group. And if I need to work with them, if, you know, right now I'm not dealing with their cryptocurrency group, I'm just dealing with their regular bankers. And if I need to deal with their cryptocurrency group, they're going to layer on like piles and piles of documentation that I need to give them. And, um, I just don't want that to happen. So I would like to stay with the pure vanilla, like regular bankers. And the way that I do that is by not holding cryptocurrency as a company. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's what we do. It keeps things simple from a company perspective. As an individual, you know, um, people in the company can own cryptocurrency and trade it and whatever. But, um, like officially from the company's behalf, uh, we don't, you know, we don't participate in the market that we, that we work in. We just work in it.
Question 3 is about tooling. TrailerBits has some fantastic open source tools for the space, such as Slither, Echidna, and Manticore, among others that are uh, already widely used. However, as you know, manual analysis continues to dominate a significant share of uh, the smart contract auditing effort. So, what's your opinion on the role of such tools in a project's life cycle, both for your auditors and for the project dev teams themselves? What's your business strategy for uh, monetizing these freely available open source tools and perhaps helping them shift left in the secure software development lifecycle, say via the use of uh, critic tools in the CICD pipeline? Sure. Yeah. So this is really a, a, a challenge between like automatic and manual because a lot of like quote unquote manual pen testing right now is aided by automated analyses. Like the way that we think about Slither is not a bug detector. We think about it as an auditor workbench. It is a tool, it's a console that enables you to look at and inspect the application. Um, it's, it's like the same way that you would consider kind of a, you know, maybe somebody can review software just sitting in Notepad or like open up Vim or maybe not Vim, we'll say Nano, <laughs> like opening up, opening up software in Nano and like paging through it. And that would be difficult because you know, s software is made to be consumed by a computer and you want to have the aid of like, well, what does the compiler think about this? And what Slither lets you do is Slither lets you open up that piece of software in Vim or in Visual Studio or in something that actually understands what you're looking at. So Slither is a tool to aid how the human brain might interpret the software that you're using. Uh, the, the, the reasonable analogy here is, um, you know, Back in back in the seventies, there was all these challenges about um, uh, chess and chess chess playing computers, and you had all these grandmasters that were playing against uh, you know Deep Blue and whatever, and it was like who's going to win? And one's automatic, the other one's human. And it's like you know man versus machine. Uh, but the reality is that as a human, as a normal person that's been trained to play chess and is not a grandmaster, if you play with a computer on your side as you are playing chess then you can probably keep up with the grandmaster and possibly beat them because it's that combination of man versus machine that really makes them extraordinarily effective and that's what slither tries to do slither is the combination of what kind of information can we programmatically extract from this system in order to inform a human to find better bugs uh, whereas you know, Echidna and Manticore are slightly different. They're not, you know, information gathering systems. They're not like, uh, you know, Slither is basically half a compiler. Slither, um, you know, goes through all the front end steps of a compiler for uh, for Solidity. It, t it takes everything, translates it to, uh, you know, a AST, transforms it into a, a SSA form, and then performs all kinds of analyses on it and allows you to query that arbitrarily. Echidna and Manticore are property testers. And property testers are another essential tool in your tool belt when you are auditing code because they allow you to express security properties. You can basically create a hypothesis. They're like a, they're, they're a hypothesis tester. So they allow you to create a hypothesis of, hey, I think that this variable, this token balance, is only ever intended to be positive. Um, are there ever any cases in the execution of this program where it can be negative? And you can program that in as a hypothesis to Echidna or a hypothesis to Manticore, and you can press evaluate, and one or both of those tools will tell you if it's possible to violate that hypothesis, if it's possible to say, oh, no, actually, this token balance can be negative. Here's the sequence of instructions that allow you to do it. So these, these aren't, like, again, so the framing, it's not automated versus manual. It's, it's really about... Um, this, uh, what, do they, what do they call it? It's like the, the half horse, half man thing. <laughs> it's, it's so nerdy. Centaur. <laughs> yeah, it's centaur. a centaur. <laughs> That's what a lot of people in DARPA call this, that it's, it's uh, centaur testing. I really hope that doesn't catch on, but at least people understand what it means. Um, so now the question is like how to monetize all this. And the short answer is no one buys tools anymore. Um, like. You know, back, back in my day, I can say that now because I'm like 36, but back in my day, you had to go get a Code Warrior license if you wanted to compile C++ or Java. 
And now what you do is you go to Microsoft.com and you download Visual Studio Code that's built on Electron or whatever. And, um, you know, the, the tools are free. Uh, the Solidity compiler doesn't cost anything. Um, you know, Sublime doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything to download whatever version of Ubuntu to grab Vim and C tags or like, you know, these, these things that people used to be um, kind of uh, like used to paying for, um, they're no longer used to paying for. So we tried to monetize uh, Slither and Echidna and Manticore inside of a system called Critic. And the market is just so tiny. There's, there's only so many people out there that are capable of using the tool first <clears throat> and then that are willing to pay for it. And what they're willing to pay for it is pennies. Uh, so we shut down Critic. Um, just like it might be great from an engineer's perspective, like an engineer might say, yes, this is a thing that I want. But uh, as a business, it is not one. And I, I just don't see it being one. So the way that we monetize it is we put them out there, we make them open source, we f basically flood the market with it, right? So everybody can access this thing. And it advertises our effectiveness as engineers. Some people come in and they purchase services from us. And I can make tons more money selling services than I can selling this as a product. And that's just the fact of it. Uh, so, you know, how do people shift left with this kind of thing? And how do people integrate it into their CI and use it earlier in their development cycle? Um, you know, it's, it's very easy. We're very, uh, like, thankful that GitHub has done such a great job and, and GitLab as well have done such a great job um, building things like actions uh, that allow people to easily adopt these sorts of tools inside their CI. So there's some really easy to use instructions that are available on the Slither wiki that enable you to import these sort of things as ways to like block your build. And we're going to be continuing to you know, build out capabilities that are just simple actions that uh, people can use to, to, to run these things, but we're never really intending those to make money directly. Um, all the money that we make from them is indirect. Uh, we really just want people to have access to the tools. We want people to contribute to them. We want people to do research on top of them. And the way that we're going to do that is by giving it away for free. So Dan, we're going to switch gears a bit again with question four. This one is about talent and hiring. For anyone aspiring to get into the auditing space, let's say specifically into trailer pets, how do they maximize their chances? What sort of cybersecurity or blockchain backgrounds would your uh, teams expect from a new hire? And do you think structured efforts such as your own blockchain apprentice program or uh, in the context of Securium, the Securium bootcamp, would such structured efforts help? And flipping this question, why should someone want to work at Trail of Bits over some of the other reputable teams in this space? Yeah. <clears throat> So the, the way that you can get yourself to be the most attractive to trail bits is we've got to have some raw materials to work with. Like when you come into the apprentice program, what we are doing is we are training you with our like secret tribal knowledge about how, you know, Ethereum works and the ways that we can test it and all this hard won knowledge that we've gained over the last uh, four years of, of testing Ethereum, as well as over the last 10 years of uh, building uh, PLT tools, building compiler tools, building you know, analysis systems like that. Um, so we need the raw materials. And the raw materials are really that you need to know how a computer works. Like at the end of the day, you need to have a really solid background in computer science. And uh, that kind of educational background that enables you to understand uh, like, you know, various systems that you're going to run into, various low-level systems. You, you need to know how a compiler works, right? You need to know how an operating system might work. You need to know how uh, you know, these systems work at a low level. There's a lot of like high level kind of programming languages and high level systems, which is basically if you're a developer and you're given an API and you have to build something and you build something out of the API, like that is high level programming, right? Uh, low level programming requires you to understand what happens behind the API. You have to have this cross layer understanding um, where you know, really good examples are, are, are when you build stuff that deals with system calls in the kernel, when you build stuff that is highly integrated with the operating system. It's, it's not always a matter of like, well, this is what the man page said. This is, you know, the exact thing that I get in and then I get out and I can just like very simply walk through like, okay, I'm going to use this piece, I'm going to use that piece. 
you have to actually do some reverse engineering. You have to think through like, well, what's going to happen after that? What's going to happen after that? What's going to happen after that? And that's what a lot of security is. A lot of security is kind of like understanding these, these disconnects between layers and finding places where an API expects a certain thing to happen, but the thing below it doesn't work that way. And that's a security vulnerability. So that kind of background knowledge um, enables us to then train you with all of this extra cool blockchain stuff that enables you to be a really good auditor and a really good security engineer for that kind of system. Um, so we need people that have been kind of around the block when it comes to computer stuff. Uh, so I'd really challenge people to, to do some low-level programming, like kind of a write a passage for a lot of security engineers is to write a disassembler or write a debugger or write a symbolic executor for EVM, right? Like these kinds of things train you how a computer works better than taking a REST API and, uh, you know, assembling something that puts two pieces together from a REST API. So, um, you know, we definitely like people that have done some software engineering, have done some programming. We ask people about what their largest piece of code is that they've written before um, and what their responsibility was inside of it, because sometimes it's a team project. Uh, and great projects that we see people do are, um, you know, like, like I mentioned, like writing a disassembler, writing writing something that is a low-level piece of software that has to, you know, really do some of these computer science things. So why do you work at Trail of Bits? A um, couple reasons. So with Trail of Bits, we engage with the community more than any other company out there. Um, we really try to open source everything that we work on. We try to share the knowledge that we gain. We publish in academic journals and academic conferences. We go to industry industry conferences we have a well-read blog like we actively want to engage with the community and i think that there's um especially you know early career folks like a lot of the people in the security security community need to build up a personal brand like they need people to know that they're out there and i think another reason why people are in securium is they're they're altruistic like they want to go out there and help they see this opportunity they're like running to the fire and the way that you can do that to the greatest degree possible is to try and raise all boats because there's only so many people you can directly work with. But with Trail of Bits, we're, we're really trying to engage with the community to raise all boats. We want everyone else to work there to, 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 to get better. Other reasons are you're going to have excellent peers, right? Like we know more than just blockchain security. We have people that are experts in the field of compilers and programming language theory and low-level testing and low-level security and cloud-native security. And all those areas of expertise are areas that you can draw on to build the best possible solution for blockchain security. Um, other reasons, you know, we, we actually have um, uh, uh, a team of cryptographers, um, which is really unique, I think, in the in the field of cryptography, um, or rather in the field of, of cryptocurrency, to, to not have a cryptography team seems like a big miss for a lot of firms. Uh, we have a, a group of about six people right now that are doing that. Um, a lot of them have formalized math backgrounds or crypto backgrounds. And it enables us to do um, kind of deeper work with a lot of the clients that we get. Um, I'd say, I mean, I don't know. I think those are three pretty good reasons. Uh, but yeah, generally, I mean, it's it's kind of a um, it's a pressure cooker for expertise. Like if you be here, it, it, rather, if you are here, then you will learn to be the best at what you're doing, um, and uh, you will be challenged by your peers. And you will have the opportunity to share that. Um, I think. I, th I think that's about. That's the pitch. Question five is about auditing bug bounties, white hat rescues, and such. There are some interesting contest-like approaches to auditing that are gaining traction and perhaps acceptance. Do you see them as competing with your services, or do they offer complementary value propositions? Bug bounties in this space are running into hundreds of thousands of dollars or even billion dollars in some cases, as you know. How do you think such incentives help? And do they have any drawbacks in your opinion? White Hat rescues from public knowledge have saved millions of dollars, if not more. Is that sustainable? What do you think about all these aspects? Um, okay. So I think a lot of people think that bug bounties and those sorts of 
things are competitive with an auditing firm, but they're absolutely not. And it's only the most inexperienced people out there that think they are. Uh, a lot of the help that we provide, what, what, we're, what we're doing is more like engineering assistance. We are working with an engineering team to help them better understand the code that they are building and help shuffle them towards a better result. Like we want them to gain competency. We want them to gain capability. And it's, it's about producing higher engineering quality. And that is something that can only be done with uh, you know, talking with the team, helping educate them about testing techniques, help them edu educate themselves about security risks, um, and, and kind of like talk through uh, the maturity of, of their security program and their security understanding. Um, a lot of what we're doing is, is very holistic, right? And a bug bounty is very different. A bug bounty is very targeted. A bug bounty is, you know, hey, you've got a bug. Here's a here's an exploit for it, and and maybe maybe here's a fix. But then all of that kind of like knowledge that um, the the receiving party needs to to build upon that information, they have to come up with it themselves, and it's kind of incumbent upon them to do so. They're not required to like learn anything from from uh, receiving a bug bounty report. They could they could not. You know, they could just patch the bug. So really, like the way that I think about bug bounties is it's it's more like insurance, right? It's not an engineering strategy. It doesn't help you write better code by saying that you have a bug bounty, but it does potentially pre prevent some like publicly embarrassing incidents. What it does is it prevents somebody from like taking that information they found and tweeting about it because now instead they're incentivized and they understand they can come to you with it. So there's this wide world of bugs that will be discovered in your system after you push it to production. And for some of those bugs, instead of being exploited, instead of being shared on Twitter, instead of being shared in Reddit or Telegram or whatever, some of them are going to come to you amicably and some of them you'll be able to have coordinated fixes for. That's what a bug bounty is. Um, so it's really like, you know, in your, in your kind of like diagram of software development lifecycle stuff, it is right of launching to production. It is, it is not the place that you want to be to improve your software development lifecycle to reduce the number of bugs you have in the system that you depend on. Um, now, I do think that a competent firm will treat all of the bounties they receive as signals and will drive them as far left as possible. They'll start to think about root causes and they'll really... Uh, be in the mindset of, well, what can we learn from the fact that this one bug was reported? And a lot of that, what can we learn and what do we do about it? That's the kind of stuff that we're training people to do when they work with us. That's where we're going to teach them how to use a property tester, teach them how to architecturally minimize their risk, teach them how to, um, you know, uh, I don't know, just like write their code in a way that, that limits the number of bugs. Um, so if the team doesn't have that knowledge, they're going to be, it's going to be very hard to kind of cannibalize and, and uh, you know, interpret all the signals they're getting from a bounty program. Now, you know, these really large bounties that people put out there, I think that they're misguided. Um, I think that a lot of times, like, again, you've got this set, you've got the set of people that discover vulnerabilities in your code after you launch. And within that set, there are people that are going to be altruistic that want to help you. And there are people that will not be um, not everybody like people already have these intentions in their head to either be helpful or not. The fact that a bounty exists is a, is like an extra benefit on top, but it's not going to fundamentally convince an evil person to not be evil. That's not what a bounty does. It doesn't like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, what happens for a person to get there is like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years worth of experiences. <laughs> You're not just going to have a light bulb go off and be like, oh, I'm a good person now. <laughs> so just because there's a there's like a massive bounty that's available, the massive bounty might just motivate the altruistic person a little bit more. And you really have to think like, is the altruistic person going to be meaningfully motivated differently if it's the difference between like $20,000 and $200,000? And probably not because they probably just believe in the system that they're looking at and they really just want to help you. Um, so. Like, I really think, what could that project have done if they instead spent $200,000 of extra effort purchasing services from an auditing company or hiring a person to work on security internally or, um, you know, just investing in security a million different other ways? 
because there's a lot of choices that you have, and it's a zero sum game, right? You only have like so much time in the world to do security stuff, and if you're going to overweight everything on the far right, if you're going to overweight everything on after the fact, you know, production kind of fixes, then you're probably missing something farther left. You're missing something earlier in the development cycle. Uh, and, and I really think that people are putting way too much weight on, on stuff that happens after the fact. Your last question was about white hat hacks. Um, you know, I, I, again, it's, it's kind of like insurance. Um, it's, it's not something you can depend on. Like it might be useful. It might not be like, maybe somebody will come to save you. Maybe they won't, maybe they won't, but even if you set it up in advance, there's only certain kinds of bugs that are exploited that are accessible to kind of a white hat hack back. Um, and it's, it's not something you should depend on and it's not something you can count on being there. So like, it's great. I'm really happy that people are doing this. Uh, but it's, it's kind of just a, it's not a positive thing. <laughs> it's certainly not a positive thing. Like it might be really exciting to look at. It's like a great little TV show or whatever to put on and like watch Twitter as it scrolls by and people are like live hacking contracts. Like that's cool. But from a, from a market perspective and from like a business perspective and from an engineering perspective, like this is, it's kind of a sideshow. Like I, I think you should mostly ignore it and you need to focus on stuff earlier in the development cycle and prove to yourself that the code is going to be safe and won't need that. Um, like at the end of the day, like you're obviously not hurting yourself if you maybe, maybe prepare for that kind of eventuality. Um, that's fine. Uh, and most projects should, right? They should have some sort of incident response um, process defined. They should think about how do they limit the, their exposure when a hack happens? Is there ways that we can architecturally design the system so that our maximum risk of loss is, you know, X, X tokens or whatever instead of Y tokens? Um, or are there automated systems that we can implement that, uh, you know, pause a contract? when it operates out of specification, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, that, that, I think that's different than like, oh yeah, like some person at this white hat group is like gonna come save me. So <laughs> maybe just ignore that in your software development plans. The next question is looking ahead into the future and imagining how blockchain technology itself with its underlying crypto economic incentives, via tokenization, Things like that may fundamentally change or affect the way that uh, you trail a bit as a company structure and offer your services, uh, smart contract auditing services in this case. So, for example, do you think smart contract auditing services may become peer-to-peer -peer in the spirit of decentralization with uh, permissionless participation, perhaps funded and executed by uh, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, and exploits automatically covered on chain by DeFi insurance protocols. There are certainly some efforts across all these aspects. So, do you think uh, these things are going to happen sometime soon, or uh, you know they're all part of uh, some pipe dream? What what role uh, do you foresee for uh, trail of pets in the event of uh, such a scenario? Um, so, I don't. I don't see, uh, you know, tokenization really fundamentally changing the structure of the services that we offer, right? Like what we need, what we offer, we offer engineering advice, right? If a company is building a product and they need some help, then we are offering them help. And the kind of help that we're offering is security help. And um, I think it's really reductive to think about it. And like what I, what I have been very not impressed by and somewhat upset by is that a lot of these tokenization schemes try to simplify the services the Trail of Bits is offering to, well, it's just about the number of bugs they find. So we're just going to pay you per bug, and that's what's going to happen. And it really, like, it doesn't match up at all to the kinds of services that Trail of Bits or any other top-tier security auditing firm is offering. That is that is not what is provided. Um, so that's a fundamental disconnect, and I, I think it's it's... Pretty insulting, honestly, like in a lot of the conversations that I've had where people try to sell me on these sorts of things because they, they clearly have done no analysis, no study, no 
interviews at all of like, well, how does an audit actually work? They just think like, oh, well, there's bugs and I can just tokenize like the fixing of the bugs and whatever. And we can just like pay for a number of bugs or we can like, you know, grade different co companies against each other or whatever. Like that's just not how it works. Um, but on the other hand, I also don't need blockchain to change some of the ways that I operate. Like we've obviously had plenty of discussions internally that maybe we should do an auction for slots in our schedule, right? Because like I can't, I, th I think people also have this fantasy that like, well, I could have my entire schedule determined by like some kind of self-balancing token. And like, no, people have needs around when the services are delivered and they pay upfront for those needs to be met. And they have expectations, like they, they need to be charged a certain price for a certain thing out the other end. You can't just like vary the price on people whenever the day comes due. So, um, you know, it, it, it would be pretty simple for me to just say, well, here's the next available slot in like April or whatever in my schedule. And instead of, um, you know, offering it out for our standard rate, which we kind of adjust from time to time based on market demand, you know, I, I kind of, uh, do some price discovery. Sometimes you learn like a competitor is charging this much or whatever or that much, or, uh, you know, here, here's, here's what this company paid last time they worked with an auditor. And we kind of build that into our pricing models as time goes on. We don't change them too often, but I'd say about twice a year. And, um, you know, instead of, instead of doing that, we could auction it. Right. Um, and you don't need the blockchain for that. Like it would be cute to have it on the blockchain. But I could very simply do that with a with a web application, and then it's basically up to the last person's opportunity to purchase the spot. And if they don't want it, then the second highest gets. And if they don't want it, the third highest gets. Whatever. Um, so, you know, I I I don't know if blockchain is really necessary there. I think that there are some kind of opportunities to tokenize things, and some opportunities to use the blockchain that are really appropriate and like they fit the model. And I don't know if offering security services is one of them. Um, on the other hand, there's all this insurance stuff and, and like, again, you know, I think the insurance stuff is good. Maybe like, I don't really know. It's, it's a really weird thing. Cause like insurance, if you think about insurance in the real world, like if you're, uh, insuring somebody against a hurricane, you're, you're like insuring the whole United States. Right. And there's some people that are in certain areas of the country that have hurricanes less often. And then there are certain parts of the country that have hurricanes more often. And you can kind of like evaluate what the weather looked like over the last 20 years and figure out, well, here's how many hurricanes we're probably going to have to pay out claims for. And here's about what the cost is going to be. And it's, it's, it's analyzable. It's predictable. Like there is some consistency to it, but insuring against software exploits is totally different. Like, the weather is one thing. Somebody showing up with a bazooka and blowing up your house is like a completely different scenario. It's, it's like terrorism insurance, right? It's like totally different. Um, so I can tell you like how many more years it might be until the Brooklyn Bridge falls down. But I, I don't know when someone is going to be crazy enough to show up with like munitions and blow it into the river. Um, and not only that, but like, in in this you know traditional versus software exploits scenario, uh, everybody has so much shared code too. Like in in the in the in the traditional software world, like we think about this a lot, where there have been plenty of uh, libraries that have been uh, that have caused massive security issues, like OpenSSL, right? Like OpenSSL, every once in a while has a security issue, and that every device on the planet needs to get patched. It's as if Every house in the entire universe were built in a one square mile radius in like Southern Florida. And now there's a hurricane and it just knocked out the living space for all of humanity, right? Like that's what happens with software. It's not predictable in the same way that insurance typically is used for. So, you know, all this kind of like on-chain insurance stuff for, for DeFi products, I just don't see the models making any sense. Um, like, you know, I, I think it was also Sam Sun who, who said something, and I totally agree with him on this, that there's this bimodal distribution of software security competency among not just DeFi products, but blockchain products in general. There's people, there are the haves and the have-nots. There are people that understand security and people who don't, people who've invested in it and people who haven't. And even for the people who've invested in it, they still make mistakes. And it's not predictable when they do. Because software is really complex. And a lot of times when 
somebody makes a mistake, like if somebody were to find a bug in Compound, like not in one of their governance proposals, but Compound specifically, um, there's like how many forks of it that people use and like what's all it, like, you know, people talk about DeFi as like these building blocks or Lego blocks or whatever that you can like swoosh together and build on. And like what, what actually is the contagion risk of one of these things blowing up? It's crazy to think about and there's no amount of insurance that could possibly protect you against that. And there's no way that an insurance firm offering insurance can predict what that's going to be. So I, I just like great idea. I, I guess it makes sense to buy it if it's offered at a reasonable cost, but I, I don't see it working out as a business. And like, I think that you just need to get the software right. And you just need to do software security stuff. Good. You need to have incidents, incident response plans. And you need to limit your risk for when things go badly, but like on chain DeFi insurance stuff, like, mm, Kind of, I, I, I'm, I'm not impressed. I'm, I've yet to be impressed. Let's say. Um, and so your final question was like, what role do you see for Trail of Bits in the event of like, you know, that that kind of stuff? Like, look, we, our, our hands are out of this. Like, we are not building uh, the product that you work on, right? Like, we are helping you by educating you and increasing your capabilities to do security stuff. We are maturing your security program. We are helping you, hand-holding you into finding a whole bunch of bugs, training you how to use property testers, um, teaching you what uh, good access control management looks like. Uh, you know, just it's engineering advice. And at the end of the day, the responsibility lies with the project that built the code. And, uh, you know, I hope that all my clients do well and I try to prepare them as best I can to do well. But at the end of the day, it is their responsibility to do well. Um, I am not accountable to their clients. So, you know, I'm, I'm there to be a shoulder to cry on and like a, a hand to help w when those scenarios happen. But, um, you know, uh, we, we work with hundreds and hundreds of clients and if, yeah, so, so it's, 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 uh, we're, we're a level disconnected. All right. So for the final question, I would like to request you to bring out your crystal ball to make predictions about the future of Trail of Bits in this space specifically. Trail of Bits, as you have uh, described, clearly has a lot of expertise, both in the traditional Web2 information security space and also in the Ethereum and blockchain space uh, with smart contract auditing services, tooling, and all the other services uh, that you are providing. So how do you see Trail of Bits growing and differentiating in the space to make a much more significant impact than it already has going forward. Yeah, so a couple things. Um, obviously, the, the quality of the tools that we're working on are going to get better. Like, that's just a given. Um, Slither as a tool and Echidna as a tool and Manticore as a tool are all getting better. They're finding better bugs. But there's a limit to how many bugs they can find. I think that there's there's going to be some really exciting development in terms of finding more like DeFi specific bugs, which will be really cool. And I think that, um, uh, you know, Slither is really pushing the limits of what static analysis is capable of. And I think that there are ways that we can make accessing these property testers, these hypothesis kind of testers easier. Um, we've already seen this, there's been a couple of specification languages that make it very kind of trivial for a software engineer to express security properties on their own. And I think that's fantastic. Um, and that's something that we're likely going to see in the immediate future from, from Trail of Bits is how do we make these tools easier to adopt and more kind of um, like expected in terms of their operation from a, from a normal software engineer. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there's uh, a bunch of adjacent fields. Like I, I mentioned, there's a couple of blockchains that, I, that I, I think are technically cool, that they're interesting. And I think a lot of them are going to go through the same learning process that the Ethereum community has. Um, but unfortunately, I also see the Ethereum community as kind of being saddled with a bunch of uh, just weight. Um, Solidity, in general, there is a massive ecosystem of tools and knowledge that are built around it, but it is holding the community back. Um, there is like, you know, a, a lot of people in traditional software used to put a lot of weight on uh, languages and frameworks as well. If the language and the framework is just safe, then code out the other end will be too. But what the blockchain community taught us is that the language and frameworks can be very, very unsafe as long as the testing tools are very good, which is what we have. 
We have really great testing tools like Slaverican and Manticore. But there's no reason you, need, you, you, don't, you can't have both. There's no reason you can't have both. And I think that it's holding the community back from building more secure, reliable, trustworthy software to have tools that are basically like, you know, building with sand. And that's what we've got with Solidity right now. The language and the compiler are not conducive to building secure software. I think they're getting slowly better over time, but these are incremental changes. And I would really like to see some more step function level changes. And I'm just not seeing that. So uh, really where I think the future is going is I think that we're going to see more of the same, that there's going to continue to be this bimodal distribution. There's going to be security haves and have nots. And a lot of the haves are going to mostly build secure software, except for a couple of blow ups, like, you know, whatever, some compound governance proposal sneaks its way in and accidentally takes down a very large application. Um, or uh, on the other hand, uh, you're going to see a lot of people that are just flinging code around and launch a project with a lot of fanfare, but that, um, you know, n nobody's looked at very closely and it causes a massive explosion. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of those. And from an outsider's perspective, it's going to give the impression that the entire community is just nothing but jokers. And that's really unfortunate because I know there are a lot of very serious players like, you know, I, I, you, know, you could, you could poke compound a little bit for the silly governance proposal thing, but in general, their software is incredible. It's highly, uh, specified. It's highly tested. Their team is highly capable. Um, and they are one of the security halves, right? So, um, that's definitely what's going to continue to happen. Uh, on the other hand, that, that fundamental problem of like people looking at projects that are security have nots and not understanding that. I think that's a larger problem that I'd like to help address, which is that people are just throwing their money around and they're throwing their money into projects that don't make sense to throw it into and they're chasing returns. But uh, there are like serious traders out there. There are serious investors out there that want to make good decisions and can't right now because it is too hard to understand the security, the engineering quality of, of a project. Um, right now, there aren't really good indicators for what a highly, like, a, for what a well-built system looks like. Um, so I'd like to make that a little bit more transparent to people. I'd like to help educate people. I'd like to help provide tools to people that allow them to make kind of educated decisions around the software they choose to use, not just the software they're building, but the software they use. Um, so I think that's an opportunity as well. But um, you know, in general, I'm just really excited to help projects that are uh, dealing with, you know, uh, large consequences <laughs> and uh, projects that are taking advantage of bleeding edge technology and uh, using brand new research techniques to help address those risks. And that is what Trail of Bits is all about. So uh, that is what the future will be, be for Trail of Bits. So with that, we are uh, done with eight questions. And before we overflow here, let's uh, wrap. So Dan, if uh, you had just one recommendation for aspiring Ethereum smart contract security auditors, say uh, those who would love to join the Trail of Bits team, what would that be? And similarly, if you had one suggestion for protocols that would like to get the best out of an audit from Tale of Bits, what would that suggestion or recommendation be? Okay, so for the Securium folks, uh, you should write code. You should write code every day, and the code that you write should be hard. Uh, like, like, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, going through this rite of passage of writing a disassembler or a debugger or something like that. Um, we really do appreciate when people's resumes come in and they can point to software that they have written. And th that is something that is a high quality signal that the person is going to be a successful employee at Trail of Bits. Um, now, in addition to that, uh, you know, I think a second line kind of recommendation is to play in all the CTFs you can. Um, CTFs are another extremely high signal. Uh, piece of information. So these, you know, capture the ether kinds of projects are are really great. But the way you have to think about them is not just can I find the bug, but how do I write a tool that finds this bug automatically, or how do I how do I create a software project out of what I've learned in this 
competition. And, and that is really the after the fact kind of review that enables you to learn the most from these competitions. It's not just I can click the right buttons in the right sequence to get the score to go up. It's sitting down and studying the challenges afterward and really trying to collect as much knowledge as possible from them. So when you play these CTFs, make sure that you have kind of an after action lessons learned kind of report that's as important as playing the challenge itself. Um, now for the projects, uh, for the projects, for goodness sake, please just run Slither. <laughs> like we put it out there. It's open source. It detects like a hundred bugs at this point, And the number of false positives it produces is very low. Like we, we've had a couple of projects that have reviewed themselves with Slither and they've ignored certain bugs that came out of it and then, then been exploited for them. And it's really, it's like depressing. <laughs> so if you've got a bug reported by Slither, Double check that it's a false positive because in most cases it's not going to be. Slither is a really, really good tool. It works instantaneously. Um, uh, you know, it, it teaches your engineers about the code they're writing. It's as essential to software development as an IDE would be. So you really should just use Slither. That's the first, first, if you're not doing that, you have to do that. There's many other things that you could do, but I feel like if you're not using Slither, you should be. Great. So that's a wrap. Thank you, Dan, for uh, coming on Securium's SafeCast and the uh, SAFU with Securium CDs and sharing your thoughts on eight questions, infinite possibilities. Good luck to you and uh, Trailer Bits in making Ethereum safer for all of us. And uh, it goes without saying that Securium would be very keen to assist you in making that mission successful. And I definitely look forward to having you again on uh, Securium SafeCast sometime soon. No problem. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot for inviting me.